Hello, Science and Ponies here, bringing you a very special and hopefully educational video. Today I'm going to attempt to explain some nuclear physics with ponies. Since I don't know what your prior knowledge may be, I've decided to define a few key terms. The nucleus is the center of the atom. Nucleons refers to the particles that make up the nucleus, both protons and neutrons. Protons are the positively charged nucleons, and the number of protons in a nucleus defines what element atom you have. Neutrons are neutrally charged and have a slightly larger mass than protons. The same elements can have different numbers of neutrons, and these are referred to as different isotopes of the same element. Some isotopes are far more stable than others. Electrons are small, negatively charged particles that have a much smaller mass than protons or neutrons. They orbit the nucleus at a distance and regulate chemical bonding between atoms. Of particular mention is antimatter. Every particle has a corresponding antiparticle that has equal mass and opposite charge. If the two meet, they mutually annihilate each other, completely converting their mass into energy. Antiparticles also have opposite spin from their matter counterparts, but this involves quantum mechanics that I don't quite plan to get into during this presentation. Maybe another time. As you may already know, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So, why doesn't the nucleus full of positive charges blow itself apart? This is due to the strong force. As its name implies, the strong force is quite strong, but only acts on very, very short distances. Nucleons that are brought into contact with each other are stick strongly together. So the addition of additional neutral neutrons can help bind together an otherwise unstable nucleus. Too few neutrons and the repulsion of protons will start to dominate. Of course, adding too many neutrons, or just having too big an atom in general, can also be unstable. The reasoning behind this also involves quantum mechanics and the Pauli exclusion principle, so I'll have to get into that another time. Of relevance is plasma. Electrons normally orbit the nucleus at varying energy levels. Whenever you give energy to an atom, you're usually giving energy to the electrons, which excites them to higher energy levels. This changes the shape and size of their orbits. If you give enough energy to an electron, it can be completely stripped off of the atom, turning it into an ion. Ions are atoms that have an unbalanced charge and are no longer neutral. With high enough temperatures, you can strip all of the electrons off of an atom, fully ionizing it and turning it into something called plasma. In a plasma, nuclei and electrons float around freely and completely independently of each other. Through the rest of this presentation, we will be using free nuclei, so you can assume that it all involves very high temperatures to ionize everything first. Now we get on to fusion, now that the background information is out of the way. In fusion, nuclei fly at each other with enough energy to overcome repulsion of positive charges. When they get close enough, the strong force takes over and the two are fused together into a new nucleus. The resulting nucleus, though larger than either of the two previous ones, actually has less total mass than the combined total of the two previous nuclei. So what happened to this missing mass? The mass is actually converted directly into large amounts of energy, mostly in the form of gamma radiation and kinetic energy of any parts that may be flying off or of the nucleus that comes out of it. This large amount of energy is due to the uh, equation E equals mc squared. Of course, as Twilight handily explained, this is actually just the simplified rest version of the more general formula below. 
So did we actually lose a nucleon in the process? Actually, we didn't. It's the nucleons themselves that actually weigh less when bonded together. This is quite surprising. But a nucle nucleon that is by itself actually has more mass than when it is bonded together. The bonded form is more energy efficient, so this extra energy is shedded. This difference in energy can be referred to as the binding energy, and is the same amount of energy you would have to pump back into the system to break it apart again. Binding energy can refer to either nuclear or chemical bonds. Next we move on to fission. Fission only works with certain fissionable nuclei. First, you take a fissionable nuclei and fire a neutron at it. The neutron then sticks to it, causing it to become an unstable isotope. This quickly radioactively decays into a bunch of fragments and a few extra free neutrons that fly out to continue the process in a chain reaction. This is referred to as induced fission, since you're actually firing the neutron at the atom, in contrast to spontaneous fission, which is just the regular radioactive decay. As you can see, more neutrons are generated, so if you have enough fissionable material nearby, this can cause a chain reaction. The results of fission are themselves are usually highly radioactive and will undergo spontaneous fission themselves. Here we have a chart of the binding energies of different elements. The stars, including the sun, mostly run on fusion power, which means they burn hydrogen into helium when they run out helium into higher and higher elements until they hit iron. They can't fuse iron because the result would actually take more ener it would take more energy to fuse iron than you would actually get out of it. So when this point is reached, the star collapses and depending on its size, may undergo a supernova explosion. So this means that elements heavier than iron can only be created through supernovae. Now I'm going to explain a little bit about how fusion works in the sun. In stars the size of the sun, Fusion is dominated by the proton-proton cycle. Here's a small key for the following slides. Here we have the neutrons, the protons, the positrons, which are the antimatter counterpart of electrons, the neutrinos, which are of special note. They're very small neutral particles considered nearly massless. For a long time, they're actually considered to be massless, but current models predict that they need to have some non-zero mass. They very, very rarely interact with other matter. Since they're so small and neutral, they fly through most of the empty space of matter, since most atoms is just a bunch of empty space between the nuclei and electrons. They're usually created in particle collisions. Whenever an antimatter particle is created, or a matter particle disappears. Likewise, the opposite is true for the antineutrino, which is created whenever a matter particle is created or an antimatter particle disappears. Here we have gamma radiation. This is just high energy, high frequency light. Usually when energy is released through nuclear reactions, it's through gamma radiation. Step one. The two protons come together and, and through the strong force bind together. This is unstable though, so one of them spontaneously emits a positron, shedding its positive charge and becoming a neutron. A neutrino is also generated at this point. This process is known as beta decay. The result of this 
is a nucleus of hydrogen-2, also called deuterium, consisting of one proton and one neutron. Step 2. Another proton comes and binds with deuterium, forming hydrogen-3, or tritium. This releases gamma radiation. In step 3. Two tritium nuclei combine to form unstable helium-6. Even with two neutrons, there's still too many protons for this to be a stable nuclei. So two protons are shedded, leaving behind stable helium-4. And that is how hydrogen gets turned into helium in the sun. Thank you for watching. If you like this, please comment below. I'd very much like to do more of this in the future, so let me know if you want something more quantum mechanics, maybe involving quarks, if you want to know more about how nuclear reactors or nuclear weapons work, or any other field of physics that people want to know more about. I'd be happy to make more.